All right. Well, hello, everybody. This is uh, Think Global. And here we are, uh, the month of October already, 2022. My name is Tim Davis. And this, again, is Think Global, where the world is our home, where strangers become friends and where friends become family. And I'm joined again with my favorite and only co-host, John (laughs) Smith. John, how you doing? I'm doing great. That was a good introduction. <laughs> you are the man. Thank you. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, it's good to see you again. Here we are. Yeah. Uh, boy, a lot has happened since our last time on Think Global. I know the world is moving quickly. Yeah. But, but here we are. I mean, you've been on multiple trips. I have just got back from the Middle East and North Africa. And um, wow, I came back and the trees had changed color. Yeah. Uh, the, the night air is crisp and cool. And the days are shorter. Oh, man. I know. It's getting harder yeah. to wake up in the mornings. It like is. Dark mornings. You know, it, actually, it is. It's beautiful. And my wife, Lynn, loves this time of the year because it's the precursor to Christmas. But, oh. um, dude, I got to tell you, I love spring and summer. That's that's truly my favorite. And so this is hard because I know what's coming. I know. Snow shoveling. Yep. Oh, boy. Yep. Anyway, here in Colorado, we can get crazy dumps of snow. And then that's a lot of work. Yeah. Anyway, all right, so that's that time of the year, but it's a good time. Um, Again, it's beautiful outside. Uh, We have beautiful days here in Colorado. I hope wherever you are, your days are beautiful as well. Anyway, what are we going to talk about today, John? Well, you know, this month we thought we would dive into uh, some takeaways from a book that you and I both read. I don't think we've done very many book reviews here on the podcast. Not this is a book review, but it's not. It's a look at a book and then what are our takeaways from that book? I think we've done that maybe one other time. Right. But but anyway, we thought we want to do that this. This month, and so uh, why don't you introduce the book, and then we'll all right, we'll dive in. Yeah, I, actually, this uh, this began with uh, one of my sons making a recommendation. Uh, you know, I have four boys. Uh, we have four boys that, uh, you know, they they love physical activity. They love running. They've engaged in sports all of their life, and so therefore, a book like this obviously resonates with them. And one of them said, "Hey, you ought to read a book, Dad." And I did on vacation, and I must admit that the book struck a chord with me. And I think that's why we're talking about today because both of you were, both of us were kind of inspired by this. Yeah. Yeah. You read it, told me I should read it. So then I went on vacation after you and I read it on vacation. And And we've recommended it to others as well. I know we've kind of sort of become evangelists for this. Yeah, book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so a disclaimer, quick disclaimer, and that yeah. is, uh, hey, if you read this book, you may not appreciate everything about it. Um, you may not agree on all the viewpoints, but I think the majority of you, if you read it, will be inspired by it. Uh, whether you're single, married, young or old, parent, or no children, uh, it's. Yeah, I think it's inspirational. I think that's the point, is that there are takeaways, regardless of whether you agree or appreciate every aspect of it. Right. Like, feel free to disagree with parts of it or not align with parts of it. That's okay. But there are takeaways that I think apply, like you said, to everybody. Yep. yep. All right. So the book is The Comfort Crisis by uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Easter. He is a professor at the University of, uh, of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, and um, he's a young guy. Mm-hmm. And actually, um, as I was uh, listening to some of the podcasts in review for this, uh, reminded that he, he, had a, he has had a tough life, even though he's in his early to mid-30s, uh, you know, recovering from alcoholism, uh, just genetically and the influence in his his family life, uh, and so he, he he's had to work through that, um, and 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 thus he's he's taken a hard look at life, and and that's the the topic that he addresses, and that is the comfort crisis, and that is uh, kind of give us a, a synopsis yeah. of that idea. Well, I think I like the subtitle of the book. So the title is the comfort crisis, yeah. but the subtitle is embrace discomfort to reclaim your wild, happy, healthy self. Yeah. So the whole book is about um, the the dangers of over comfort, which we'll talk about in a minute, but also the benefits of embracing discomfort, right? Which we'll, we'll obviously talk about right. in a minute. So, right? Yeah. yeah, and not everybody listening right now says, "Oh, I want to embrace discomfort." <laughs> Nobody act, thinks that. That's right. It's not our, it's not our natural impulse to say, "I just want to be uncomfortable." But I think in reading the book and listening to uh, really a lot of scientific. Um, 
process evidence, um, ideas, thoughts, um, I think uh, inspires the reader to to choose to embrace yeah. a measure of discomfort. In yeah, their life. and I should say that was my biggest uh, resistance. I think I told you this when you recommended. It. I was like, ah, oh, Tim, I don't want to read another macho book. I right. You know, there's this uh, there's this fad right now of books written by Navy SEALs and right. former Navy SEALs, and it's kind of a lot of macho right. stuff. And I've read a couple of them. They're okay. Yeah. yeah. Not my not necessarily my flavor of ice cream, but. Um, but you promised me, you said, no, this takes a more scientific approach mm-hmm. to some of these topics. I thought, okay, yeah. I'll give it a try. So, right. yeah. Uh, and thus, it's, there's a lot of cred with, with this book, and yeah. I appreciate the cred behind it. So, anyway, the, the main idea of the, of the book, um, The Comfort Crisis, is that most of our modern lives are completely comfortable. And, and one, of the, you know, one of the things I think I even told you about when we were chatting about it was that um, you know, he, has, he, he reminds us that our world is lived at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Like, <laughs> we go to work in a car, 72. Uh, we go to work at 72. We come home, and it's at 72. And we go to the gym, and it's at 72, and we watch TV while we're working out. <laughs> you know, everything is comfortable. And yeah. that's, just, that's just one of the ideas. There, there's multiples there. Yeah. Well, you know, he talks about how we no longer wait until we're truly hungry to eat. We just, we just eat when we feel a slight tinge of hunger, or even if we're just bored or stressed. Like, um, we don't have to work for our food anymore other than walk into the pantry to eat. So right. even around our food, there's no discomfort. Right. Um, obviously, we're talking about the majority world. I mean, right. there are people who are We hungry. recognize yeah, that. Yeah. Okay, but that's we're talking about the majority world. Right. Uh, those of us in North America, that context. Right. Uh, we, we can just walk to the pantry and get food where our ancestors had right. to walk for miles right. to find something, to kill it, and then right. haul it back to the the village or the tribe right. or the cave or wherever they lived. Yep. Um, we have come a long way from those days. That's right. People were hunters. They were harvesters. They had to bring it back to yeah. the table. It wasn't just a luxury to walk into a pantry or with preservatives right. or a refrigerator where it kept it cold. Right. Um, it was just a different uh, time. And so therefore, hunger it w- was more normal. Yeah. It it, uh, it was acceptable. Right. And, and most likely, and that's the point of his book, is that people were just healthier because of that as well. So yeah. anyway, we sit in su- uh, comfortable chairs all day. <laughs> Right. I mean, um, the bottom line is we've done everything we can to eradicate discomfort from our lives. Yes. That's the bottom line. And everybody can agree with that, right? I want my house to be 72 degrees. I'm not going to go home tonight and make it 45 degrees just so I can be uncomfortable. Right. It's not to say that comfort is bad all the time, right. but we have done everything we can to eradicate discomfort, including boredom. Yes. Right? And I know you're really passionate about some things we're going to talk about of how we work hard to eradicate boredom. Yes. Um, we've... We've eliminated food prep, right? Yes. Like you know, like we were talking about, you don't have to kill it, prep it, haul it back, you know, all that. Um, we've even eradicated physical physical exertion from our lives outside of when we choose to go to our air conditioned or uh, or, or uh, controlled environment right. gym. Like you said, run on the treadmill and watch TV while you right. work out. Like right. other than that kind of physical exertion, we we've mostly eradicated. Like I don't walk to work, right? You know right. what I mean? Yeah. So. Uh, we're trying to eradicate that discomfort from our lives. Right. And, you know, even the fact uh, from physiologically, the idea that our bodies are wired to carry things. Yeah. Well, everything we've done is to remove the need of carrying things, yeah. right? So you can just think about that in multiple ways in our life that we don't carry things. And therefore, the very uh, the strength of our back, the core structure of our, of our bodies, the, we've lost yeah. what our ancestors naturally had because of the lifestyles they lived, of right. carrying. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a lot of what he's getting at yeah. there. And yeah. it leads to physical problems. And and we have a yeah. list here, uh, John, of just some of the stuff like obesity, heart disease, cancers, diabetes, you know, depression that comes from it, anxiety. Um, and I, I like the point that uh, that you put down there in review of the book, and that is even more fundamental issues like a lack of meaning and purpose in life uh, yeah. uh, that challenges can give to us right. that sense of purpose and right. meaning in life. So. Right. And so what happens is we live in these tiny circles of routine, right? And we all, we can quickly think about, oh yeah, I know what my daily routine is. Like everybody's got their own daily routine. So we live in these tiny circles of routine rather than exploring uh, the boundaries of our potential. Right. And that's what this comfort crisis has yeah. brought about. Right. But anyway, he, th- he spends the book, it's interesting, he goes chapter by chapter and kind of by the end, I figured out I think he was kind of picking out a different comfort of each chapter, like boredom, 
being in nature, uh, food. He talks. Right. There's a whole chapter on food. Um, he kind of picks these things apart chapter right. by chapter. But right. um, anyway, so yes, it, it is one thing. I think it was in chapter, gosh, three or four. He says something to the effect of all these things that you just mentioned: obesity, heart disease, various types of cancers, diabetes, depression, and anxiety. Um, he says these things largely didn't exist before the 20th century. Wow. Basically saying um, our comforts that we've allowed into our life led us down this road. Right. And in many ways, what I, what I, one of the points I remember what he said was like, we might be living longer, you know, just because of like the progress in medicine yeah. and uh, being able to detect things earlier on in life, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the argument he has is that uh, the quality of our life yeah. is not the same. Yeah. Uh, we might live longer, but we live more miserably uh, right. because of the comfort of our lives. You have two quotes there that I I love. You, I don't know if you do. You want to mention those? Those are those are good quotes. Um, yeah. So talk, he talks about um, that the research is confirming that that discomfort is actually good for us, yeah. and that's what we're getting to. Is is we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about how it's good for us, but. Um, here's the quote, a radical new body of evidence shows that people are at their best, physically harder, mentally tougher, and spiritually sounder after experiencing the same discomfort that our early ancestors were exposed to every day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So challenge, difficulty makes us better. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. And, is he, and he goes on to say, scientists are finding that, finding that certain discomfort protects us from physical and psychological problems like obesity, heart disease, cancers, diabetes, depression, and anxiety. Um, and it even this discomfort, it protects us from more fundamental issues like right. what you just mentioned, um, like feeling a lack of meaning and purpose. Right. Yeah. And actually, uh, one of the uh, chapters I loved, he, he, he alludes to like parenting styles, <laughs> like, you know, the helicopter parent yeah. um, designed to protect their children, um, you know, always involved. Uh, but now uh, in the last decade, we've seen the momentum of a snowplow parent yeah. where the, the whole thing is get everything, every obstacle, every challenge out of the way of your children. Yeah. Uh, like you clear the path for them. Right. And thus they never learn what comes from facing a challenge and right. facing um, difficulties that shape them as an individual. Yeah. So um, this, the very motivation of loving a child enough to be a snowplow parent really backfires. And, um, and kids are not learning how to handle the challenges that come with adulting in life and right. growing up in life. Right. And yeah. And as, as a new parent, have we talked about that? Yeah, I'm a new parent. Hey, congratulations! Thank you. Yes, we've talked about that. I think. <laughs> yes, six months now. Yeah. So as a new parent, I think about that of because there is a temptation. I can feel it already. There's a temptation to clear the way so that right. life is as easy as possible for my son. You know, like it's okay to have that temptation. But as he gets older, it'll be interesting to see how my parenting right. style right. shifts and um, and I. Help him navigate challenges, but don't remove those challenges right. from his path. Right. And that, yeah. And we, we, and we do remember that, obviously, at certain ages, you do certain things yeah. right, because that's what they need. But sometimes what they need as they're growing older is to just face a tough situation. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it helps them navigate life. Yeah. So. Okay. Anyway, key, key concepts. Yeah. Key All concepts right. uh, from the comfort crisis. So the first one, this was uh, one of my favorite. And I'm... Um, I want to talk about the concept of comfort creep. Yes. And I had not considered that before, but the idea is that as we experience less discomfort, right? so as we become more comfortable, we don't become more satisfied. right? Um, actually, our threshold lowers for what we consider uh, to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so, so a new comfort comes in, like I, I don't have an example in my head, but a new comfort pops in. Let's say... Uh, you don't have a home with with a uh, central air conditioning, right. and you're doing fine. You got the wall unit, you're doing okay, and you turn the fireplace on when it gets cold, and it's fine. Well, then you move into a new house that has new AC. Well, now your threshold for discomfort has lowered, and then when let let let's say the temperature goes up to seventy five, you know, what's going on here? I'm I'm burning up in here, you know. Right, right. Where in your old house, it was no big deal. You just popped open the window. You didn't think anything about it. You That's know exactly right. So the more comfortable we get, we actually aren't becoming more satisfied. Right. 
we're right. just lowering our threshold for discomfort. Right. And maybe maybe the analogy would be, and I don't know, maybe it's because I'm older, but a smart home makes you dumber. <laughs> um, actually, when you think about it, right? Everything, you just say something and lights come on. Yeah. You say something, the lights go off. Well, right. What if it doesn't work? Then you got to stand up and walk over there and turn that that's, switch. That's so, actually a good analogy yeah. because we didn't have smart homes five, 10 years ago. Right. Now we do. And you're right. If... It doesn't do what I tell it to do. And I got to get up and walk over there. Well, I always had to do that. That's exactly right. But now the comfort creep has come in and now I'm like, oh, you know, I'm huffing and puffing, getting up, going to turn the light switch on. That's exactly you know? right. That's exactly right. <laughs> All right. So the second takeaway I love, uh, and and I'm going to throw this one in here, and that is the idea of boredom. You've already addressed boredom. But uh, one of the things uh, that uh, Michael Easter, the author of this book, The Comfort Crisis, talks about is that boredom is good for us. Yeah. Um, and how uh, we hate boredom. And when we are bored, it feels uncomfortable. But fascinating, they've done some uh, some research that people who are bored think better, mm. create better, uh, their minds are sharper. And uh, one of the studies that uh, came out that I thought was very fascinating is that they did a controlled study of two groups of teenagers. Uh, one group of teenagers was given their cell phones. And for 10 minutes, they could do anything on their cell phones. They could play it. They could enjoy it. They could scroll it. They, 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 whatever. They, they could browse. They could post. Um, another um, equal amount of teenagers in another room were put in front of a TV screen. And on the TV were two dudes, two men, folding clothes for 10 minutes. Well, obviously, after 30 seconds, a minute, they're bored. And so their minds were wandering yeah. and uh, they were thinking about other things because all it was was two guys folding clothes. <laughs> um, so one very entertained on their cell phones, the other is very bored watching these two guys fold clothes. Then immediately following it, they gave them a test of creativity. Hmm. Those who were bored were by far more creative than those whose minds had been preoccupied. Wow. For the moments ahead. So one of the things that I love is that uh, I, I remember as a kid often being bored and, and my parents saying, I'm sorry, uh, just go out and find something to do. Yeah. And you naturally uh, were motivated and your brain was creative and you tried to consider, you know, like what next? And, and so I love that perspective of that boredom is a gift. Yeah. Um, but if you watch people today, uh, you can obviously see boredom is not, they don't see it as a gift mm -hmm. because if they're bored, they pull out their phone. Uh, right. Now they're checking posts. Now they're looking up Google ideas or whatever. Right. It's just, we're always trying to fill our minds instead of enjoying what it means to be bored. Yeah. So it's yeah. Good, yeah. Good stuff there. I love that. I mean, yeah. that's, I was, uh, I was just on a, I do an annual fly fishing trip with two other friends I've known my whole life. And we, we do this trip, go, go up to the mountains, no cell phone service. We're just out there together. And one night we were talking over the fire, a uh, little fire that we had outside and, and they were, we were just talking about life and, you know, busyness and families and work and, and I just made the comment. I don't know if it came because this book was in the back of my head. Yeah. I don't know where it came from, but I said, you know, I'm I'm fighting for boredom yeah. right now. Right. Like tr between travel and family and work and just life in general, I feel like I'm fighting for boredom. Right. I want to just have slow evenings at home with my family. Right. You know? Yeah. And and th the way that came out of my mouth, I thought, huh, that's an interesting way to put it. Like yeah. I had not really pre-thought of that. Right. I just said it in the moment. But but I think that's true. I think right. in the busyness of our lives, we have to fight for boredom. Meaning, maybe put your phone on do not disturb and put it in a drawer somewhere. Right. Because yeah. we're all addicted to these devices. And right. so put it out of sight. <laughs> yeah. And I, I will say, like in addition to that, you know, the and this is, we can we can move on here quickly, but uh, you know, the scary part is that he throws out there the 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 national average right now is that people spend eleven hours per day on their device. Um, because they're fighting against uh, boredom. And the device is designed to control our attention yeah. and to read our minds and to read, <laughs> read what we're interested in. Right. Um, and so um, that's what it's intended to do, and therefore we have to fight against it. So that yeah. was one of the points that I walked away with, that just the caution that a device does not control me, my family, uh, family members, et cetera. So yeah. it's just something to to take a hard look at. Yeah. I mean, okay. There's a ton of takeaways from the book. I mean, yeah. it, again, like we said, the disclaimer is may not agree with all of it, but we cur encourage people to just read it, just yep. give it a shot. Yep. Uh, but how does this relate to think global? Like that's what yeah. we want to get back to and kind of circle around to where we talk about 
um, the world is our home where strangers become friends and friends become family. And we work in some pretty crazy places. We work with some of the best people in the world. We travel. You just came back from the Middle East. Uh, we're all over the place. How does how have you seen the correlation of what you read in that book to what we do? All right. All right. So let's let's play this out, John, because I think this is significant. Because what it does is it forces us uh, to think outside of ourselves. Like yeah. we our little worlds that we the routines that we have, the safety that we enjoy, the comforts that we have, mm. our nice little home and our nice little town, and mm. you know don't bother me with the rest of the world. Blah blah blah. <laughs> but um, I do I do believe what this should do is cause us to think about the rest of the world, to understand the rest of the world, and to embrace the fact that sometimes when we, when the rest of the world has an impact on our lives, our hearts, our minds, and even our uh, physical bodies, mm. it does bring with it discomfort to a certain degree. Uh, I uh, recommended this book to one of um, my colleagues, our colleagues here, a young lady, her name is Danny, and she's been reading it. And I said, hey, what stood out to you? And so she gave me this quote. It comes from a, a gentleman who took this man, Michael Easter, hunting uh, way back at the tundra of the, <laughs> of the Arctic. Um, and, uh, you know, a very dangerous adventure, actually, for 33 days, um, uh, way beyond where people live. And um, anyway, uh, this guy, Donnie, says this, basically, if you want to have amazing experiences you have to put yourself in amazing places. Mm. I love that. And Danny, you know, she's lived in Laos. And uh, she said, I realized that was true about me. Mm. I have had experience in, or amazing experiences in life. And it's because I, I, I put myself, I found myself in amazing places like the country of Laos in Southeast Asia. And right. so uh, is that comfortable? Is it pleasant? <laughs> is everything easy there? Absolutely not. Right. It's hard. It, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Well, uh, you know, you can go back to other episodes of this podcast and you can see where we interviewed people living in Mongolia. We interviewed somebody living in the Middle East, right? Right. right. And are their lives comfortable? Absolutely not. Right. The Mongolian winter is probably the opposite of comfortable. Right. Oh, you yeah. Know? yeah. Uh, the desert in the Middle East in the summertime is the right. opposite of comfortable, but right. none of these people are looking for comfortable lives. They're, right. They are seeking discomfort for the thing that you said, right? Like, if you want to have amazing experiences, you have to put yourself in amazing places. Right. And that's exactly what we're seeing these people do all right. over the world. So right. if you want the world to be your home, the whole travel in and of itself is not comfortable. Right. Jet lag is not comfortable. Right. Planes are not comfortable. Right. Like, but if you want to experience the world in the way that we've been privileged to experience the world, you have to be willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations right. um, to experience the amazingness of what's right. out there. Oh, yeah. I, I actually think what the great, uh, I'm going to put it this way, the great American dream is that comfort brings meaning. And I would say comfort in that sense robs us of meaning in life. Mm. And I think as we see these people around the globe who are living in these places that actually, I mean, they're, they're hospitable, they're beautiful people, beautiful lands, et cetera, but it's not comfortable in right. that sense, but it has, they've given up that for the sake of meaning, for right. that which is important. Yeah. The sake of purpose, right? right? He talks about, what was that originally? Like the fundamental issues, like a lack of meaning and purpose. That's I can right. promise you the people we work with, they don't lack meaning and purpose. Right. That's right. They they have meaning and purpose. And it's not just the physical uh, challenges of a of a Mongolia, but but people raising their family in another culture, trying right. to trying to do schooling in another culture, trying to learn another language somewhere else in the world. Yeah. Those are very uncomfortable experiences. Yes, that's exactly challenges, right? right? Yeah. And yes. and they're doing it right. You know? And that and that's what inspires me, right? Right. So anyway, I you know John, at the end of the day, uh, we think. Uh, I think you and I agree. It's a great book. It's a great it read. The Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter. Again, we may not agree with everything. We might not appreciate everything, but I will say the premise of the book uh, really is um, of value to us. and helps us rethink how we live every day and actually how we do life and how we help others do life. So uh, to you who are out there, uh, we would encourage you to take a, a listen if you do Audible or uh, you know, read it if you if you love the printed page, but it is uh, it's worth it. A lot of good research, a, got a lot of good information, just uh, a different perspective on um, on life, yep. and um, I think a very healthy approach to living every day. So anyway, I loved it. It very was good. good. Yep, agree. All right, man. All right, this is Think Global, where the world is our home. 
where strangers become friends and friends become family. And we encourage you, embrace a challenge today, uh, face the world, enjoy the world. And until next time, John, uh, we are we are off. We're out of here. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Yep.